So Adler, welcome to the show. I'm, I was uh, first surprised of your work when uh, David Madigan was discussing it in advance of the uh, AIPM conference at which yes. you presented. And I thought it was really interesting because one, um, well, there's one thing in particular that sticks out about you. You're an MD, um, which I thought was very interesting as far as having a r- real appreciation of the domain knowledge. And, um, but also I thought it was very interesting how you were uh, working in this uh, causal versus an observational data space, which I think is always very interesting. And it does show a deep appreciation about how these informatics or AI systems are actually being applied. So I guess maybe, uh, well, I wasn't asked you just to introduce your research, but maybe just, we should just hop into it and say, you know, uh, when you talk about your, uh, the observational aspects of the data that you're uh, analyzing, why is it important to specify that you are working on observational data? Um, I think that it's important because, you know, there are problems that only arise in the context of working with observational data. Um, and also there are certain things that you might want to study that are not amenable to experiment. Um, and for various reasons, it can be potentially too exper- too expensive to experiment with or unethical to experiment with. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a wealth of observational data. And so, you know, we think that it's valuable to experiment with, ob- to, uh, to do research with observational data um, uh, in the absence of experimental data and all the questions that we might be interested in asking. And so it's important to specify that it's observational because we don't have the ability to manipulate things in the process of the data collection. And so the data that we have is the data that we have. We had no part in the creation of that data um, in, in any meaningful way. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think I think it's interesting. You've actually we're already sort of have this like bifurcated explanation where the first one, the more obvious one, the one that I sort of always glom on is that essentially we want to make use of this observational data because it is vast. It's re- more readily available. We can't always be experimenting on things, and therefore we need to have methods that a- account for the data generative process. That this is not experimental data. Um, right. And I guess the other bit though that it, maybe we could just hit on that for a second, which is. Um, We don't always want to have some data is, for example, unethical to have from an experimental perspective. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, Because I think that might be a little bit of an under discussed topic for observational data analysis. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I mean, you pick your favorite, uh, your favorite topic where you, you know, you couldn't imagine an institutional review review board approving, uh, you know, a given intervention and you have your example, let's say, for example, you were trying to study the effects of illicit drug use on a given outcome, you certainly could not design an experiment, uh, you know, administering illegal drugs to individuals, but, you know, we do have lots of observational data of individuals that that are users of, of illicit drugs. And so um, that's just one example, but there are many, many examples of things that are unethical to do um, you know, and there are more mundane examples. For example, um, it would be unethical to deliver uh, to deliver deliver care that um, would be considered substandard. Um, and so, if your experimental design is one that delivers substandard care in one arm versus standard care in another arm, that would be unethical. But natural variation in clinical care is such that some patients really some patients receive care that some, some would consider substandard but maybe appropriate in that circumstance and uh, and vice versa and so there are certain things that are uh, more subtle than sort of the obvious examples like illicit drug use but um, but there are many things that are difficult to conduct experiments around that we have observational data for that is, makes it uh, possible to study them Cool. And uh, now, I guess, hopping back onto the more common example, you know, can you talk a little bit more about what is it that makes observational data different from experimental data? Why, why should people care about this and really take that into account? Um, well, I think that uh, it comes down to really two factors or, you know, at least two factors. In experiments, you can manipulate things and you can also choose what to measure. Um, and so those two things are, are quite important. Um, and 
uh, in answering a specific scientific question um, and ensuring that there's internal validity in answering that scientific question. Um, and so, you know, manipulation, uh, in particular randomization, is you know, the most most frequent manipulation, um, can provide certain statistical guarantees, but in observational data, you don't have either of these options, really. You can't randomize. Um, you have to sort of make do with what you have. Very cool. And so I guess um, now uh, moving on to that, making do with what you have is uh, is the issue, for example, with causal modeling. And uh, for those who are getting worried, don't worry, we'll get to the, the GANs and the uh, PGMs pretty quick. But I guess for the causal modeling aspect, is this why causal modeling is needed? Because we are essentially trying to handle this issue where you don't have access to the guarantees of randomization and control. Right. Uh, definitely that causal modeling is necessary because primarily because of the issue of confounding, really. Uh, you know, uh, if you want to understand uh, the effect of one thing on another thing, you need to isolate that effect. And it can be quite difficult uh, in, in the context of observational data where there are third variables that influence both. And I guess just as a uh, word of warning, what is the issue? So for example, let's just pretend like we don't act. Well, let's pretend that we haven't heard from Adler on this issue or David Madigan or Patrick Ryan or any of those folks on this issue. Um, and you just say, ah, oh, you know, observational data is good as, good, good as anything. Um, I'm just going to analyze as it is and start telling the world what I know. Um, the, if someone pursues that approach, what is, what is the problem? Where, where do problems actually start cropping up? Well, um, you want to make sure that, you know, the claims that you're making, the inferences that you're drawing from the data are as close to the truth as possible. Um, and when individuals start acting on knowledge that has been generated from research, there's potential for harm. And so you, uh, you want to avoid that at all costs. You know, um, in medicine, we're trained to do no harm first. Uh, and in research, it's the same. You know, we want to um, provide evidence to guide practice in such a way that we won't be inadvertently, you know, increasing risk of, you know, significant adverse events because we didn't uh, take into account significant confounders in our research. Cool. And I guess uh, this actually brought up another sort of strange question for me, which was that, um, let's say uh, you do have experimental data. Um, so we, we basically said that if we have observational data, it pretty much implies that you need to be using some type of causal methods or, or some other way to address the fact that there is, you know, this um, irreducible confounding issue, that there is non-randomization, that there's probably severe biases in the data generative process. Um, hmm. Let's say you're actually handed a nice experimental data set. Um, does causal modeling, does that sort of inference perspective still matter in that regard? Um, I think that it could matter, certainly. Um, it could matter, certainly, but, uh, but it depends on what you're doing with the experimental data. Uh, it depends on uh, um, whether you're taking advantage of the manipulations that were in place for the experiment or not. Um, you know, I think that there are really limited uses of causal methods uh, that are designed for observational data when thinking about randomized experiments, um, primarily because these methods are designed for, um, you know, limiting the impact of various types of confounding, um, and those things can be directly controlled in experiments. Um, and so if you're aiming to answer a question, a causal question, about individuals that are in one arm of the study and you cannot take advantage of the randomization that was in place uh, to, you know, to construct the two arms or and arms of the study, then you may need to rely on, uh, on causal methods to address potential confounding. Uh, but as long as you're taking advantage of the manipulations that were in place for the construction of that non-observational data, then I think, you know, the, uh, there, you know, you're best off relying on those manipulations for ensuring, um, in, ensuring that, that confounding is limited. 
Yeah, I think you've, you, you have described that really well. And it sort of brings up the issue that say, for example, that you're handed some experimental data and um, you're obviously now tasked with uh, discussing or doing some form of inference on a question that for which the experiment was not designed. Mm -hmm. There's probably, I guess you could call it case one, which you've highlighted, which is that the manipulations, the randomization um, is still perfectly aligned with what the experiment, uh, the experimental question that you now want to answer. And if mm -hmm. it is, then, you know, obviously party. Um, yep. Whereas yep. Um, alternatively, if it isn't, you need to start recognizing that and increasingly treat it as effectively a non-experimental or an observational uh, exactly. data. And exactly. I guess the expertise of having someone like you is that there's a, I wouldn't call it a gray zone, but you know, there's, I guess, a spectrum on to what extent the biases and randomization have started to fail in this new question. So yeah. whether it's not completely observational as if you're just collecting data off the street, but at the same time, it's not that sort of pristine scenario that you would like. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that there's, there's definitely rich research um, that is being done and that can be done with uh, a mix of experimental and observational data. Um, you know, if you know that you have randomization, you can, uh, you can leverage that in other ways as well. Um, but, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, to answer your question, you know, uh, experimental data, is you know has these benefits you can you should leverage them if possible if you can't and you're and you're trying to answer a very different question then you may you may again need to rely on on these causal modeling approaches cool and uh so now just for the super eager people one last question before we jump into the uh the gans and the pgms but um uh you know we, we've talked a bit about like uh, you know adjustments uh we've said you know leveraging the data in some way or another um what are the ways, just broadly speaking, that you are adjusting this data? Is it from a like a selection process? Um, what, what are sort of the, the broad strategies of addressing these causal challenges? Yeah, and so uh, there are there are many. Uh, the literature is quite broad, um, but uh, there are certain approaches that attempt to uh, to address confounding by treating individuals as their own controls, for example. Um, these uh, self-controlled approaches are, um, are a relatively recent approach that is valuable. Uh, the, uh, I, would, I would bucket, as you'll see in the presentation that I'm going to give a, in, a, in a little bit, I would bucket most methods into matching methods um, you know, stratification methods slash adjustment methods and uh, weighting methods. And, you know, weighting methods are very related to matching methods, et cetera. But I think that, uh, uh, that those are sort of the main, main buckets. Um, the, uh, the work that we do uh, falls mostly into the weighting, uh, weighting methods bucket. Um, but there are also, you know, and, and all of these methods, I think, are, aimed at addressing uh, observed confounding. And there are a set of methods that are designed for addressing potential sources of unobserved confounding as well. Great. And um, now here it is. So um, you have, I've you know, obviously I did my research in advance, uh, looking into the cool work that you're doing has really cool illustrations, which is always an important start to uh, getting people involved. Uh, people should definitely check out Adler's website if they just want to see, if anything, how to get people really excited about your research. Um, he's a great example of that. Um, so I guess my question is, now that we've identified these, these uh, two buckets and you said, you know, your work focuses on this one bucket, um, why are things like uh, GANs, and PGMs, and maybe we should identify, uh, we should uh, describe those to the audience briefly for those who aren't familiar, but uh, why are these types of models particularly useful or like well-suited for the, um, the causal analysis challenges? Yeah, so probabilistic graphical models are um, a formalism for uh, constructing and specifying probabilistic models where the structure of the graph corresponds to, uh, to the statistical properties of the distribution. Um, and properties of the graph allow you to read off statistical independent statements 
readily and uh, allow you to also simultaneously encode uh, in an interpretable way knowledge about the domain in the graph. And so, you know, probabilistic graphical models are, are particularly well suited for causal modeling because they make explicit, uh, well, not always, but they allow you to make explicit mechanistic assumptions and encode domain knowledge into the structure of the graphs. Um, and, uh, you know, there has been a, uh, there is a long shared history between probabilistic modeling with graphical models and causal modeling uh, struck with uh, structural causal models. And so uh, there are manipulations that can be made on probabilistic graphical models to, um, to, uh, to do causal analyses uh, when you assume a particular causal structure um, for your domain. Uh, and I think that, that the interaction between, you know, uh, expert knowledge about the causal structure in a domain um, and the data that's generated in association with that and the kinds of uh, manipulations that are of interest when, um, when studying a particular intervention make it a particularly well-suited tool for causal modeling. We, uh, we don't actually take that approach primarily um, when in doing causal modeling uh, ourselves and in our research, um, primarily because we're focused, in, we're focused on the case where we don't really know um, the structure of the mechanistic relationships in the, in the data and uh, trying to see whether we can still study uh, you know, the uh, causal questions of interest in that context. Out of um, yeah, out of curiosity, um, when you're talking about this, um, for, uh, first of all, I will double down that what, what, how, how you describe PGMs, I think, is a very important way and it highlights many of the attractive reasons. So especially for like early career data scientists um, or people interested in like machine learning, uh, PGMs are a very fundamental way to start better understanding the probabilistic nature and the, uh, I guess, the independent structures in different models. Um, so I think that that's very interesting and is a very good way to better, more fully grasp the implications of your statistical or probabilistic models by mapping these things out this way. Um, but I, that the last thing that you brought up is something that I sort of wanted to bring up. When we're talking about um, the me a mechanistic understanding of your data and how you said that you, you shy away from these PGMs because is the idea that if the models misspecified, a PGM will have will struggle, struggle more greatly um, and there will be more problems with the model due to model misspecification um, in, the, in the sort of the correlational relationships? Certainly, if you have the wrong causal model, um, that can certainly lead to problems in inference. Um, the, uh, however, in our case, we're thinking, we're thinking more in the context of where you just have so many variables that constructing a causal graph from all of these variables is um, is a you know, is a giant task, um, and we want to be able to leverage the data that we have, the data that we can collect about individuals in the context of you know all of their interactions with the healthcare system, and uh, in that context, it's quite difficult to construct causal graphs for every use case of interest that takes into account all the variables that might be influential. So then what say do you use as an alternative to these PGMs and these causal graphs? Right. Um, and so uh, we, <clears throat> we do a couple of different things. Uh, I'll talk about one of them in more detail today. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we specify um, a different type of probabilistic graphical model that doesn't sort of specify the domain structure, but makes sort of just one simple causal assumption. Uh, you know, that work is not published yet, but we're, but we're working on um, developing models that embody the notion of causal independence. This is sort of a very old notion that dates back to the very early days of, of um, the development of probabilistic graphical models. Uh, one of the models that embodies this notion of causal independence is the noisy OR model. And uh, we've been working on developing a probabilistic graphical model that embodies the noisy OR assumptions uh, in, modeling, in modeling data. Uh, and so I won't talk about that too much, but that's sort of one thing we're doing. Another thing that we're doing is we're, uh, we're uh, trying to understand uh, 
um, the contexts in which you can um, perform causal inference in the context of unobserved confounding, um, in particular leveraging the uh, leveraging the uh, the fact that you that there may be multiple causal questions of interest, um, and you may know something about some of those uh, causal questions, and leveraging both the existence of those causal questions and the knowledge that you have about them to um, to learn something about some unobserved uh, confounding structure. And so that's a separate class of thing that we're interested in. And then lastly, um, we're interested in leveraging deep generative models. Um, and, you know, one example of which are these generative adversarial networks um, to, uh, to construct uh, essentially weights uh, for weighting methods in order to perform causal inference with observational data. And you know, you mentioned uh, that we should probably describe what these are in more detail in um, in the um, in the uh, the talk that I prepared for a little bit later. I go into a little bit more detail on exactly what generative adversarial networks are and how they work. But uh, but very briefly, um, they're uh, they've been shown to model um, high dimensional data distributions very effectively without overfitting. They have some limitations, uh, which I'll discuss, um, but the, the main benefit is that they can model these very high dimensional data distributions uh, with what seems like limited overfitting. Uh, and as a result, they, they may be well suited to um, uh, identifying what I call natural experiments that exist in observational data. Well, that is very cool. Um... I suppose now is the time that we should hop over to your presentation. Okay, great. Uh, so let me share my screen. Cool. So today I'm going to be talking about adversarially learned balancing weights for causal inference uh, with a model known as the counterfactual Kaigan. Uh, this is work that was primarily done by a PhD student in my lab, who was now um, who is now uh, at Regeneron uh, in their genetic center, Amelia Averett. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and collaborators at, at NYU's Karat Institute. So if we think about uh, causal inference, we, uh, uh, we often think about it in the context of a set of individuals um, where uh, there is some treatment uh, that is applied to some set of individuals and a different treatment or the lack of treatment that is uh, applied to a different set of individuals. We, um, we want to observe outcomes in the context of each of these treatments, um, but ideally we would, uh, we would apply both the treatment and the alternative treatment to each individual um, simultaneously. And so what we typically have is the treatment being applied that is observable and the lack of treatment or the, uh, the treatment assigned to a different treatment for that individual that is unobservable. And this is known as the counterfactual circumstance. So we typically observe the factual circumstance and not the counterfactual circumstance. So the Rubin causal model uh, is, uh, is a model that uh, dictates under what assumptions we can make valid causal assumptions. Um, the first is the stable unit treatment value assumption, which is simply assumed to be true, typically. It's not too onerous of an assumption. And the second is strong ignorability. And strong ignorability effectively um, is when the, the outcome is independent of the treatment assignment um, given the covariates. There are two forms of, this, of strong ignorability with and without covariates, but that's a minor detail. One of the consequences with strong ignorability is that um, the feature distributions are, are equal. In particular, feature distributions for potential confounders are equal. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to uphold strong ignorability and assume um, SUTFA. So how do we uphold strong ignorability? Uh, we, uh, we can do this by enforcing uh, feature balance. Um, and what this is is um, when the empirical distribution for the covariates under the two treatment arms, assuming that all of the covariates, all the confounders are, um, are measured, uh, 
is uh, is the is the goal. One of the ways to do this is with randomization. Um, we can uh, with randomization we ensure it to be the case that the outcome is independent of the treatment assignment. But we can also do this uh, with data manipulation only in the circumstance where um, where the uh, well potential confounders are observed. And so there are several approaches that um, that individuals often take to um, manipulation of observational data to um, to arrive at uh, um, comparable cohorts that allow for causal estimation. One of them is matching. Another is adjustment and stratification, and the third, uh, the third one of the one of the others is weighting. We're going to focus on weighting for the presentation today. And when we think about weighting, uh, weighting is when uh, a sample of interest is not representative of, a tar rep representative of a target population that we care about. We can disproportionately consider units to make the samples look more like the target. Um, and so in, as an example, if we have uh, a population that looks like this, we can potentially weight them in this way and resample the population according to these weights and uh, end up with a population that looks like this. Similarly, if we have a different population that looks like this and we want these two populations we want to compare this population and this population, we, um, we can also similarly weight individuals from this population, resample this population, and we end up with two comparable cohorts. This idea of weighting individuals to construct comparable cohorts is very related to the idea of important sampling. Important sampling draws samples from a proposal distribution and reweights the distribution using importance weights so that the weighted distribution represents the target distribution. Um, the, in this diagram, we have P of X, which is our target distribution. We have Q of X, which is our proposal distribution. P of X will be, will define a, what we'll call for now a counterfactual distribution. It's not a, you know, a standard name for, uh, for what, we're, what we're discussing, but we'll define what that is a little bit later. Q of X is our data distribution. So this is the distribution of, let's say, the covariates under um, under the uh, under one of the treatment arms, and what we're aiming, what we'll aim to do is we'll aim to reweight the um, the distribution un, uh, under which the real world data uh, was drawn to some other distribution p of x, and the way that we'll do that reweighting is through importance weights. So a common method of weighting that uh, that accomplishes this goal is inverse probability of treatment weighting. Um, units are weighted according to the inverse of the propensity score. Uh, one of the uh, the issues with this is that it's it is model dependent. Um, you know everything is model dependent, but um, but the uh, the approach that's typically taken for inverse probability of treatment weighting is one that is uh, with a very specific model specification and can lead to unstable weights um, if propensity scores are very close to zero or one. What we'd like to do is we'd like to learn stable feature balancing weights. Um, and so the way that we go about this um, is by using what's called a generative adversarial network. Um, general, uh, just to motivate this a bit, um, generative adversarial networks, um, they produce an implicit generative model that specifies a stochastic procedure by which we can generate data. Um, it does not provide a likelihood that you can evaluate or maximize uh, that is typical with probabilistic models. It is an implicit generative model. Um, we'd like to use these models for full distributional matching on features, and one of the reasons that we uh, we think that it might be valuable in this context is because of uh, GANs, uh, the research on GANs showing um, showing quite good models for high dimensional data without significant overfitting. Um, and we'd like for uh, the model to be less prone to instability originating from the model specification. So we'd like to specify a flexible model, but one that is, uh, that is fit in such a way that it does not overfit uh, significantly. And so uh, this is in contrast, contrast to the prescribed models that, uh, that often provide an explicit parametric specification for a distribution. Um, explicit, explicit functions are often used to model propensity scores that are used in inverse probability of treatment weighting, and we'd like to reduce this model dependence. Okay, so generative adversarial networks are a class of models where um, we have some data and we'd like to construct an implicit generative model of that data. 
the way that we do that is we construct a generator G um, and G takes as input um, samples from a random distribution, such as a multivariate normal and, uh, and, um, and transforms those samples into a set of samples that uh, aim to resemble the data. We have a, in this approach, have a, a, a separate model D, a discriminator that aims to distinguish samples of data from samples from the generator. And so uh, the approach in this model is to, um, is to have the generator produce forgeries of this data and the discriminator to distinguish uh, data from the forgeries. As we train the generator to fool the discriminator and we train the discriminator to distinguish data and forgeries, we, um, we progressively improve the ability of the generator to model the distribution that, is, that characterizes the data. This uh, amounts to a minimax problem uh, where the objective written here is the uh, objective that we're going to optimize. We're going to um, uh, improve the log probability of, um, of distinguishing real data from fake data um, by, um, by contrasting the expected value of the log probability under the data distribution with the uh, with one log probability uh, of one minus the um, the the expected value of, of log of one minus the um, probability of the forgeries, and so we m minimize this function with respect to the generator, and we maximize this function with respect to the discriminator, and uh, the what I described in, uh, informally um, results in. A uh, generator that is an implicit uh, implicit generative model of the data of interest. Of particular interest with the generative adversarial network is that it the optimal solution minimizes the Jensen Jensen Shannon divergence between the model G and the data distribution of interest. But this isn't a sufficient for causal inference, so we're going to construct something uh, based on the vanilla GAN. And so if we have two arms of a study, a treatment arm and a comparator arm, um, we're interested in downweighting, uh, and they're very different populations generally, we're interested in downweighting the individuals that received either the treatment or the comparator that are not comparable and upweight those that are comparable so that when we're uh, performing our comparison, we're focusing strictly on the comparable set of individuals. These are the individuals that form what we'll call the natural experiment. How do we do this? We construct something called what we call the counterfactual chi GAN. Um, we distinguish our model from a typical GAN by first uh, demonstrating that we have two discriminators instead of one. And we're also minimizing uh, a chi square divergence rather than the Jensen Shannon divergence. The way that we make the way that we minimize the chi square divergence is by replacing these discriminators with variational functions and um, and uh, and applying um, prior work on um, f-divergence minimization uh, in the context of implicit generative models. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but to state that we changed that um, that objective function slightly, um, and that results in a minimization of the chi-square divergence rather than the uh, Jensen-Shannon divergence. And so the way that what happens here is that this generator obviously cannot produce wonderful forgeries of population one and population two if, if the generator is producing one set of samples from a single multivariate normal distribution. But, it, uh, but if we're minimizing the chi-square divergence, it produces a distribution that, um, that overlaps with both population one and population two. And this overlapping distribution is uh, a particular distribution of interest because it minimizes the chi-square divergence. And so um, I'll skip this slide and just to mention that uh, just to mention that the the form of the chi-square divergence is something like this: the expected value of the ratio of p and q squared minus one, and that. It actually is uh, bears great resemblance to the variance of important sampling estimates. 
And so if we imagine ourselves comparing two cohorts, uh, one that received treatment A and treatment B, um, by in a process of uh, resampling, where we resample uh, those in arm one to resemble a population, an overlapping population, and we resample those from population two to, uh, to resemble an overlapping population, um, we would like for the important sampling estimate of uh, the contrast between those two groups to be minimal. And so uh, what we do is we define this um, counterfactual chi-gan to minimize the sum of the chi-square divergences between the generator distribution and the data distribution for each of the arms in, um, each of the, arms in the study that we're interested in running. So uh, that is the theory behind how we construct and why we construct the counterfactual Kagan. I'll discuss now some simulation and some application to clinical data. In the simulation, we construct two cohorts in which the overlapping portions of the population are well known. We apply the counterfactual Kagan to learn the weights and we investigate weights of, over, of the overlap population versus the weights of the non-overlap population. To be more specific, we define a population, what we'll call population one, that is constructed of samples from uh, what's what we call subpopulation A and subpopulation B. So subpopulation A produces uh, individuals with, um, with cohorts that follow, with covariates that follow a particular distribution. And those samples from population B follow um, uh, follow, have covariates that follow a particular statistical distribution. Population two is constructed um, from individuals of subpopulation A, and so there are samples from subpopulation A in population two that overlap with uh, the covariates of population A from, subpopula from population one. And so we have an overlapping portion of population two in population one, and we have a non-overlapping portion in, in population C and population B. And so the way that we construct this is that we sample, we create three subpopulations, population, subpopulation A, population B, and population C, um, by generating uh, covariates from randomly generated multivariate normal distributions. We also generate some discrete features, but that's a, that's a detail that we're not going to discuss in, um, in, uh, in a lot of detail during this talk. Um, and the two population are mixtures of, sub, of the subpopulation. So we have mixtures of of subpopulation A and subpopulation B for population one and mixtures of subpopulation A and subpopulation C for population two. We have 4,000 instances per arm and 2,000 per subpopulation. We also simulate an outcome. That outcome is based on the subpopulation. And so each subpopulation has its own outcome distribution. Um, and we, uh, based on these distributions for the, um, for the outcomes for each uh, subpopulation, the average treatment effect for the mixture distribution, that means if we're directly comparing population one and population two in sort of a naive way, we would observe a treatment effect of 50. If we are comparing only those individuals that are comparable, um, in this experiment, we have uh, an our average treatment effect of 70. Okay, and so uh, what we did to evaluate this is we firstly visualized uh, the results of the simulated data. Uh, we uh, computed average treatment effects and we also computed effective sample sizes. We also, we, in these experiments, we compared to a variety of existing methods, both uh, recent and not so recent. Um, to evaluate uh, our approach to feature balance and, um, and treatment effect estimation. Okay, and so if we look at the simulation results, firstly, we can visualize what the, con what the situation looks like. If we look at two selected features out of the uh, 10 that, uh, that characterize each uh, sample, um, we have population one, uh, in a with a sub, with a multivariate normal um, with two subgroups um, here and here, and we have population two with two subgroups here and here. We have uh, if we look at the data from a different lens uh, and we focus on the subpopulation. Subpopulation A 
is here, that is overlapping between the two groups. Subpopulation C is here and subpopulation B is here. If we, uh, once we train, we've trained the counterfactual chi again, what we observe is samples from the generator that look something like this. The blue points here uh, represent the samples from the generator and it is clear that minimizing the chi-square divergence results in an implicit generative model that focuses on the overlapping population um, um, uh, between the two uh, arms of a, of a study. And if we um, take the weight estimates that result from the uh, application of the counterfactual chi and, and weight all of the samples by their, uh, by their weights, we observe that um, the uh, samples from population one and population two that have uh, any significant weight uh, in computing treatment effect estimates are those from the overlapping group. And so here are a few, here's a, 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 um, an animation that demonstrates what the, um, what the model looks like as it, um, as it proceeds uh, throughout, uh, throughout training. Uh, what we see here is a loop of the model um, model identifying the overlapping uh, overlapping groups within each population and increasing those weights while minimizing the weights of those subpopulations that are not um, not near uh, the overlapping um, section. Okay. And so if we look at now at the average treatment effect uh, um, that is estimated as a result of applying each of these models to that simulated data, we observe that the counterfactual chi again produces an average treatment effect that is very close to the, the, uh, the treatment effect associated with the overlapping distribution. And we observe a, an unweighted treatment effect that is uh, very near what we expect for the naive uh, treatment effect estimate from uh, comparing population one and population two. And uh, we have uh, treatment effect estimates for all of the other uh, comparator methods that we uh, evaluated. Um, and uh, some are overestimates and some are underestimates, but um, many produce, uh, there are a few that produce estimates that are very close to the, um, the naive estimate of directly comparing population one and population two, but other approaches um, estimate uh, estimate quantities that are necessarily exactly the overlapping ATE, and so the, the, it may not be the case that they're necessarily wrong in that sense, um, but they are estimating something else. And what we're arguing in this work is that that the overlapping the ATE for the overlapping distributions are the only valid ATE to be estimated. Uh, and when in applying the counterfactual chi gan we maximize coverage, but also um, uh, focus our analysis on the subpopulation that is uh, directly comparable uh, for a causal analysis. When we look at the effective sample size, we see that the counterfactual chi gan uh, effective sample size is very near 4,000, which is the um, which is what we would expect in in comparing the two subpopulations. Um, and so each subpopulation has 2,000 points. And so if we're focusing only on the, sub, on the comparable subpopulation, we would expect the effective sample size to be near 4,000. When we applied the same method to clinical data, what we observe is, uh, well, firstly, the setup is that we, um, we design observational cohorts uh, for a, an intervention of citagliptin, a comparator of glimepiride. This is... Uh, following the, um, the eligibility criteria associated with a published randomized clinical trial. And so we, uh, we applied the eligibility criteria to restrict our analysis to a group uh, that is similar to that which was studied in the clinical trial. And we uh, evaluate the 37 most frequent measurements for, uh, for the intervention cohort and the comparator cohort to assess um, feature balance. Again, we apply the counterfactual chi gan to the cohorts, and we uh, we also learn weights from all of the comparators. To assess uh, these methods, we compare the absolute standardized difference of the means, and the results are shown here. Um, it's uh, it's very small, so you know I'm not expecting uh, 
um, you to be able to read all of the um, all of the uh, different variables that were uh, evaluated on the um, on the y-axis here. But uh, the counterfactual chi gans um, average standardized difference of the mean is uh, shown in orange where smaller is better, so closer to zero is better, and the unweighted uh, average standardized difference of the mean is shown in gray. And so what we see is that firstly, there's a lot of variance, um, but if we look at the average, average of the average standardized differences of the mean, we note that the counterfactual chi gan has the smallest of the set, has the smallest of the set. And so uh, we, um, it seems that the counterfactual chi gan, although there's high variance, has the lowest average standardized difference of the mean when uh, considering a relatively small cohort in a relatively high dimensional setting, uh, considering the number of individuals and the number of covariants. So these experiments suggest that counterfactual chi gan is an effective method for, of learning feature balancing weights to support counterfactual inference. Um, our goal, uh, again, is to uh, take two cohorts, a treatment cohort and a comparative cohort, and focus on the natural experiment that may have occurred and, uh, and compare those, uh, those groups uh, to produce an average treatment effect that is reflective of the comparison that is valid. The counterfactual chi gan could provide an alternative means to causal inference for observational data. And also, if we assume that all, well, you know, in general, we need to assume this for our um, for our analysis that potential confounding variables are all observed. Um, and uh, we, in that context, we, uh, we can estimate average shooting effects um, using weights uh, based on the counterfactual chi gan. There are several limitations to this approach. Um, the first is that you know, we inherit all the limitations of generative adversarial networks. In particular, generative adversarial networks are very notoriously difficult to train. Uh, because you because the optimization is a uh, it's a minimax optimization where uh, we're attempting to find a saddle point and uh, and you know there are uh, there are numerical issues in trying to optimize to a saddle point um, the in addition when uh, when doing this in a high dimensional setting these hyperparameters that are chosen um, can make all of the difference between uh, convergence and not and so it's very sensitive to hyperparameter choice. Assessing convergence in GANs is still an open question in an active area of research. And so this is a major limitation of this work. And lastly, comparison to RCTs may be difficult be, uh, due to heterogeneity of treatment effect. And so even though we applied the eligibility criteria for the clinical trial that we, uh, we looked at, there may be other differences between the clinical trial population and the, and the observational cohort that we are studying, which make it difficult to make direct comparisons to randomized controlled trials. Um, the paper is published, um, so if you're interested in learning more details about this particular experiment, it's published in the Journal of Biomedical Informatics, um, and there's a reference at that QR code. Um, this work was supported by the National Library of Medicine, um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me at any of these means um, and uh, um, and I look forward to uh, look forward to discussing. So as I said, obviously Adler gives very cool presentations. I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, I think it was very illustrative and very helpful. Um, one of the first questions that I had with regard to this, uh, obviously I tend to fixate on the challenges of any of these methods, especially because I think that uh, when people talk about how they debug the challenges, typically they're bringing in two aspects. One, technical aspects, which are very easy to appreciate across the board, or alternatively, there's domain level aspects, um, which I think that you are uniquely positioned to answer answer on many levels um, and trying to basically bring those two different challenges together and understand really where any given method can, you know, either fail if something that dramatic happens or alternatively that it stands for further improvement. Um, and one of my questions was when you're sort of building these counterfactual models and looking at sort of, I guess, the intersection space of uh, these two different populations, what happens if these two different populations that you're trying to build don't actually have much intersection or alternatively that the most similar patients are fundamentally different on a large number of dimensions. Is that 
really much of a challenge for you? Or yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. That is uh, certainly a challenge. And but I think that you know one of the reasons that we um, we focused on estimating uh, effective sample size in in our experiments is that you know that gives you a sense of you know what your true effective sample size is in, in comparing these two interventions. <clears throat> if your effective sample size is one in, and you have cohorts of uh, you know, many thousands, then you know that the comparison that you're trying to make is fundamentally flawed in some way. And so uh, I think that you know, us having that assessment of how big that overlap is, is critical. And many approaches already do this. This is not something new. And so, um, you know, in propensity score modeling, oftentimes there'll be a sort of a visual analysis um, that compares preference scores or propensity score distributions um, to assess how much overlap there is between two cohorts and assess whether the comparison is one that's worth making. Yeah, cool. Because um, I guess to try to construct this for people who aren't uh, quite as familiar uh, with this issue, uh, sort of maybe a toy example in my head would be something like the following, where um, you have a set of patients, and um, when you're trying to match them, uh, for example, you might look at a few demographic is aspects, like I'll uh, just say age and sex, um, and they have those. Say they uh, they match very well on age and sex, but then they differ on a large number of things like, for example, location, economic outcome, um, whether or not they're a cat or a dog, you know, like, let's just pretend that like there's some different species. Like, yeah, we can, we can find all these like 17 year old males, but one of them's a cat and one of them's like a human being. And so the idea is that um, if, if they differ fundamentally on some of those dimensions, they become irresolvable. Um, although I guess, the counter to that is one of the advantages of these this observational data is that hopefully it mitigates that because you are uh, really making the most of this huge amount of data. Where so whereas it might sink a clinical trial size data set, it might it would be less uh, less dangerous for an observational data set. Right. Yeah. Exactly. In the medical context, you might have, for example, a treatment that's only applied to the elderly or only applied to those that are very sick. Uh, because it's particularly toxic, say. Um, and if you were trying to compare a first-line therapy to a last-line therapy, um, you know, you may not, there may not be many patients that overlap in terms of the comparability there because, you know, you have relatively healthy patients in one, uh, on one treatment and relatively sick patients on another. And when you're trying to understand the outcome, you may, you may only be looking at differences associated with the health status of those individuals rather than the effect of the treatment itself. Yeah, yet again, your, your example is much better than mine. I think that uh, the first line versus last line of treatment is a very, um, th th that is a very illustrative example. Um, just out of, uh, to maybe build on this more for people who aren't as familiar with it, uh, what is the heterogeneity of treatment effect? Uh, HDE. What are sort of the challenges and examples of that? So maybe if we just re-explain that and yeah. discuss it a bit more. Yes. So heterogeneity treatment effect is an interesting topic. I, you know, I, I'm hoping to continue studying this particular topic um, as, as you know, uh, as I go move forward. It's um, it's the situation where um, different subgroups, let's say roughly, uh, roughly define it uh, as uh, the setting where different subgroups of patients um, have a different treatment effect um, in association with the treatment that, uh, that is under study. And so when you're trying to compare two treatments, the, um, whether one treatment is better than another may depend on which group you're looking at. And so, for example, let's just take the elderly as an example again. Um, you may, when comparing two treatments, it may be the case that treatment A is better than treatment B in the elderly, but much better than, uh, but, uh, but treatment B is much better than treatment A in those that are, um, let's say, in their, in their uh, in midlife, 30 to 60. And so uh, if your cohort includes both anyone above the age of 30, you may conclude that treatment B is better than treatment A generally because it, it was better in that cohort overall by a small margin. But if you were able to separate your analysis into those um, younger than 65 and older than 65, you might find that 
um, that in the older than 65 group, treatment A is, is marginally better, but treatment B is clearly preferred in those 30 to 65. And so the existence of that difference in uh, treatment effect in those two subgroups um, is known as heterogeneity of treatment effect and can, it can make a great difference in many analyses. So uh, in bringing that same example to sort of the experimental observational um, comparison, if the clinical trial, if a clinical trial was only done on those older than 65, we may not be able to understand the, the, the true treatment effect in those between 30 and 65. Um, and uh, we won't, uh, I'm personally interested in extending, understanding and extending the results of clinical trials so that we understand the effects of drugs on a larger population than was studied in the clinical trial. And uh, you know, we have to be careful about this precisely because of this heterogeneity of treatment effect issue. Yeah, um, can we uh, put a quick pin in this expansion of clinical trial subjects? I'd like to come back to that um, because it's it's really interesting. But uh, I guess just to provide sort of the counterexample, someone's saying, well, I'm having these generative models. And the idea is if there are these sort of categorical differences in a patient's response, um, well, the advantage of having these generative models is that essentially we're upweighting, we're rebuilding these uh, populations even if they're missing from the data itself, um, is yeah. so. Is the, I, I guess that that's that's the argument in favor of it. But if the alternative is, is like, well, can you populate those at all if you don't have sufficient data? So what what is the interplay between those ideas? And am I missing something? No, I think that that's that's right on. Um, that's spot on. I think that the um, you know if you don't have the data to analyze a particular causal question then you just simply don't have the data to answer that, that particular causal question. And so I think focusing on the group that you can make causal claims about only makes sense because you want to make a valid claim, but you also understand you want to also want to understand who that claim is valid for. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> and so I, I just want to make sure I'm answering a question. Can you repeat uh, uh, briefly uh, what your question was? Oh yeah, I think I think you have answered it. Where uh, effectively, um, fundamental question in data science, healthcare, anything, do you actually have the data that you need to answer your question? And true. boom, that <laughs> done. Uh, yeah, it's it's just interesting because like obviously the if we want to be hyper conservative about it, the question is like, do we have the data to answer a question? Well, uh, have we run a clinical trial on it? Have we randomized it? Have we done like four phases of this clinical trial? Um, that's what we need. And then so I guess bringing this causal bit is saying, it's like, well, we don't actually need that to get somewhere along the lines of having a better form of image. We might have this observational data. We have these techniques that are meant to sort of try to tease out the information that we can. We don't take the observational data at face value. And we do these other weighting or sampling methods or something that tries to estimate what those effects are if we were running that trial. And yeah. then beyond that, which I think is what you really nailed on the head, it's like, and then there are cases where you don't even have that. And that's why you need to be sensible and say, um, the data isn't there, for example, to address this uh, uh, heterogeneity of treatment effect question. It might be for all these other groups, for example, but for some of these other groups, the, the question, the research question remains unanswered. Yep, yep, exactly, cool. exactly. Cool. And I think even in the group that you do study, there may be heterogeneity, even in the group that you can study, there can be heterogeneity of treatment effect. I think there, there's a lot of work to be done there as well in fully characterizing that heterogeneity and understanding it in an interpretable way. Yeah, I the, the the world, the clinical world is much more high dimensional than we typically like to think of. Um, and there are dimensions and even things like if you take into account age, which seems like it's a single dimension. However, you know, you can say, well, this is a continuous variable. At the same time, there might effectively be categorical effects at play, um, depending on what access to healthcare they have, the frailty of their body, things like that, uh, their willingness to seek out medical help, where you can even take a single seemingly one-dimensional variable, and clinically there's several effective dimensions on top of that. Yeah. Cool, and now uh, to the question that you were talking about before, um, expanding clinical trials. Um, just to sort of like paint the picture about how you do that, is the idea that we first, that you're sort of trying to take this clinical trial data and you take the attributes of these 
patients. And I guess for people who aren't as familiar, you know, a clinical trial could be as small as, you know, a dozen or a hundred patients, or for these larger, like phase four trials, you know, you could be having tens of thousands of patients. Where, where is sort of your starting point for saying, we're going to take these patients we've observed in the clinical trial and start trying to do some type of causal modeling for unobserved patients. Is that, is that the path? Yeah. So the first thing that we'd like to do is, um, is take the results of the clinical trial and ensure that we can uh, replicate some aspect of it. Um, we need to assume that there is some subpopulation within the observational data source that allows us to uh, replicate the results of a, of a given trial. If we can, if we can do that, then uh, then it raises the possibility that we might be able to extend the results of that clinical trial to unstudied populations, study using only the observational data. So, if we understand, if we are able to eliminate confounding sufficiently to replicate a clinical trial, then we may be able to eliminate confounding similarly and extend the results to unstudied populations. Well, uh, honestly, that sounds really systematic and sensible, though those seem like very logical steps to be proceeding, uh, given your clinical knowledge. And I think that's, again, a great reason why it's so nice to have some like Adler working on these problems, because you do understand the domain very well. And I think that this is very helpful to help illustrate how um, practicing, uh, do you call your, consider yourself the, a bioinformatician or a statistician? Well, what is your self-appointed title? Yeah, you know, I, these titles, these, I think they're fluid, but I, I do consider myself a biomedical informatician. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And obviously it is, it is quite useful to, um, it's very nice to see someone's thought process because I think that's what people can get the most out of this. It isn't so much about what they're using, but the question of why they're using it and how they're making the most out of it. Um, so Adler, I really appreciate your time. You've given us a lot to think about, and you've given us a great example of how people should be approaching these problems, thinking scientifically and also thinking technically. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was great to be here. Hey guys, this is Glenn. Thanks so much for listening to this most recent episode of the Philosophy of Data Science. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and hitting that subscribe and bell button, or a small channel in every bit helps. If you have a lab, a department, some students or some colleagues who you think would enjoy this episode, please consider sending it along. Again, every bit helps, and we really appreciate your word of mouth. Our next episode on the philosophy of data science will be coming out 1 p.m. Eastern time, Wednesday of next week, so we look forward to seeing you then. But if you can't wait to get more data science, machine learning, and statistical content, feel free to look around the rest of the channel. We have a large number of playlists, including things like machine learning for healthcare, uh, ethics and AI, and things like that. So give a look around. There's plenty more content for you to enjoy. You can also check out our website to not only see past episodes, but what's coming up and see who our sponsors are. Thank you to our sponsors for your support. Now, while the views discussed on the show typically range between extraordinary and mind-blowing, the stated views don't necessarily represent those of the host, our sponsors, my employer, your employer, the speaker's employer, or anyone else not saying those words. And as always, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. See you next week.